From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Due to an unfortunate case of COVID, yeah, that's still happening, our format will be a little bit different tonight. We're going to extend the traditional interview we do and get a little more in depth with our guest. Tonight, we sit down with filmmaker Shane Anderson, whose newest film, The Lost Salmon, continues his work examining fishery issues in and around the North Coast, and in particular, the health of regional fish populations. We've had him on Keat before, featured his amazing work, and we're thrilled to have him back to talk about his newest project. Well, Shane, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I just uh, watched your film um, again, The Lost Salmon. Um, it's something that uh, I talked to our general manager and we will definitely be trying to uh, get on uh, the airwaves here at Keat. Um, it's actually going through a PBS distributor. Um, so that's good news for you. And um, that's a pretty wide ranging national distribution. But um, your film, The Lost Salmon, is absolutely um, powerful. It's in some ways, it's devastating, but it's also hopeful. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, you've been working on this for two years. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? I mean, in the film, you're everywhere. You're all over the, the Western Hemisphere, at least in the United States, uh, and all these different sort of tucked away watersheds and studying the, um, the status of spring Chinook salmon. Um, talk about how you got on this particular subject and then also what the process was like. Yeah, you bet. So originally, I was um, going to do a portrait on Dr. Mike Miller. I, I'd become aware of his science and uh, on the Spring Chinook gene and just kind of had this idea for this little short film. And it was going to be easy. and I was going to get it done, you know, in a few months. And then basically, I just got into the story and, you know, started unpeeling the onion and realized just kind of the urgency of the uh, issues facing Spring Chinook, not just in one place, but across the entire range. So I really kind of wanted to show that um, that wide scope of the problem and that that really, you know, this isn't an isolated issue. And, and this new genetics is showing that if we lose this gene, then they're gone forever. So it's it really it really became kind of a, a more of a personal mission for me and a personal film for me too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's why I eventually kind of inserted myself as a narrator to try to weave it together and kind of threw myself into the story as like a complete afterthought. Like that didn't even happen till, you know, like the final four months of post-production, you know, trying to figure out how to put the story together. So sure. the whole thing was just kind of like this evolution and just kind of letting the story just kind of like come through me, like, you know, and being able to kind of chain, you know, make decisions on the fly that, you know, might not have been my original vision, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, yeah, just really let, just really trying to be a conduit for that story. Yeah, I, I think it worked. I mean, the fact that you are in the story yourself, I think gives the viewers an anchor to sort of view the story from a narrative position. And I think that that helps in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you mentioned something just now that is brings uh, is brought up in the movie, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but the, the spring Chinook gene um, is something that comes up as a recent genetic discovery about spring Chinook um, salmon. Uh, can you describe what that is and why it might be so important? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, salmon are probably like the one of the most complex animals on earth as far as genetics because of their, you know, local adaptation and how different populations of salmon literally have different genetic code structures adapted to those specific environments. So a Klamath salmon is much different than a salmon up in Washington state. And that's why you can't just take a salmon from a, another river and, and put it in another river and expect it to thrive. It's because it's adapted to that place, that sense of place for 15 million years, you know, yeah. since the like literally co-evolved with the landscape and the river to have that genetic imprint. And one of the, you know, other fascinating parts of salmon and that adaption is migration. So basically what this new genetic discovery found with the spring Chinook salmon was that there's actually a gene called GREB1L that is a trigger for migration. And it basically tells the fish when to return home at the best optimal time to maximize uh, different habitats. Yeah. And forever, you know, fisheries management, you know, since fisheries managing has, has begun since colonization 150 years ago, 
people have just managed very simple, um, like a Chinook is a Chinook, even though there's these different migration times. And that's really put us in this position of, um, you know, the potential to lose and, you know, extirpate this like really revered, important run of salmon. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating to me. One of the elements of, of the film, I think, that comes through is that you deal with a lot of tribal members and tribal experts who are, you know, obviously tied in personally and uh, culturally with the rivers that they're that they're on and the fish. Um, it's like in order for Western civilization to get to the realizations that were just sort of inherent in the culture of these tribes, we have we've had to like assemble the brightest minds and have like these sort of, you know, um, genetic epiphanies and all this stuff go on. But it's just part of the cultural inheritance that we've for so long just kind of shunted aside as, um, you know, I mean, we don't, it's not savage any, anymore, but we don't respect it as much as we should. And it's always, all this knowledge is just hopefully leading us back to this more holistic uh, approach and it's like these things are so complicated like we want to get so simple about a chinook is a chinook or you know we're going to protect the species but as long as we you know just protect you know the fall salmon or or whichever you know slice of it it's like we think we're doing the whole job but that's never complete enough um and i uh your film uh you know does uh, pulls that thread for me and uh, i think it's it's fascinating there are so many bits and pieces in this and I, I took some notes um but I mean, I guess, what do you want to accomplish with this film? I mean, as I, I think I was just hinting earlier, the, the, the obstacles to really addressing this problem are so um, massive and sort of embedded uh, culturally for us that there, there isn't really an awareness or an appreciation for the value of some of these things among the general population. So is that your aim or what do you, what do you want to see accomplished with uh, your, your movie? Yeah, I, I, I just want to raise some awareness of this issue so we can, you know, put the proper uh, recovery plans together and do what's necessary to save this, this gene that is so sacred of this animal that's one of the most revered on the, the entire West Coast. And, you know, to, to go back to your, your, er, your earlier statement about basically the convergence of traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous people with modern science. I mean, to me, that's fascinating that modern science is just catching up with something yeah. that they've been saying for thousands of years. Absolutely. Indigenous people know that spring Chinook are different than fall Chinook and have been fighting with the agencies and the bureaucracies, you know, about that. Just like, listen to us, you know, we've been here, we've evolved with the salmon in the land too, you know, and, and it's such, I just really hope that we were, we're moving in a direction where, where the, they're, you know, ancient knowledge and stories can be implemented into science and and you know because this this story right here is exact proof that the most cutting edge genetic science coming out of uc davis is saying basically something that they've been preaching for forever so. exactly right respect for the land I mean, for one thing um i mean so where do you i mean the uh the the doctor the geneticist what was his name again i'm sorry uh dr mike miller yeah, he makes the point that he's a, uh, you know, a uh, an optimist and that he has hope. But I mean, um, how much hope do you hold out right now? I mean, you mentioned before uh, in our uh, correspondence that you were just recently out filming Dead Salmon in Washington. I mean, uh, how how bad is it and how much hope can you hold on to right now? Yeah, so, you know, after going across to kind of some of the last strongholds over the last few years and really exploring some of these populate these isolated you know uniquely truly wild populations left yeah. butte creek right like in the yeah yeah you yeah. know i mean the fact that like butte creek is still kicking out so many fish despite you know there was that major fish kill last year after we filmed but you know, those, <laughs> those fish have been like you know, the fish that have survived are carrying on the most resilient of that genetics. And that's kind of that whole natural selection process and why it's so critical that we recover wild populations and not just rely on hatchery artificial propagation mm -hmm. as our, you know, silver bullet. You know, that's like just such a recipe for disaster and extinction. Mm -hmm. And um, I am hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful in some places. I'm, I'm terrified in others, right? And, and I think that really, if this genetic science can lead to further protections under the Endangered Species Act, so the agencies tasked with managing these, these fish and these, these stocks have the tools necessary to implement the proper um, 
you know, regulatory measures and recovery efforts that it will take to recover some of these fish. Because it's the, the differences are, I mean, what's needed to restore fish are different across the entire scope of the range. You know, like we're not recovering the, the Snake River Chinook, the last of the Snake River Chinook, without removing the lower four Snake River dams. They are going extinct. That's the trend line. You know, we're not going to recover the populations in Washington coast and Oregon coast and Puget Sound without reforming the mixed stock fishery in Alaska that's harvesting endangered fish while targeting other fish, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bright spots is like the Klamath Basin. Yeah, sure, you know, there's a fish kill going on right as we speak right now because those dams were supposed to be out in 2020 and bureaucracy and red tape has held it up. But fortunately, uh, they just released the final Im environmental impact statement that's, that's the final hurdle in getting the license transfer going. So we're looking at starting dam removal next year in the Klamath Basin, which should dramatically reduce water temperatures and open up 400 miles of historic habitat. Wow. You know, there's a problem though. We've lost the genetics in that upper basin that were adapted 100 years ago. But however, it's great dam removal is going to improve the water quality of the Klamath in that in that migration corridor for those populations that are left in the Salmon River and the Trinity River. So, you know, th there is hope and there is momentum and it's just such an urgent time. We don't have time to kind of do more studies on these things. We got to like implement action now. And unfortunately, agencies are really tough at, at you know, instant, impl you know, um, implementation of, of action. Absolutely. I mean, that's another thing that uh, didn't really come up too much in the documentary, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the politics surrounding, you know, I mean, environmentalism or, or whatever in terms of the changing administrations in Washington and how that impacts uh, action on the ground. Have you seen that? I mean, obviously, we had four years of Trump into the next two years of chaos from Trump. But I mean, um, did that impact what you saw on the ground in terms of efforts to uh, address this issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the science came out, you know, quite a few years ago, and there's been peti the Klamath was the first petition to protect Spring Chinook under the Endangered Species Act, and and I think the first one got denied, and they resubmitted another one, you know, and the National Marine Fisheries Service has not uh, approved it yet, nor any of them really, based on this research, and you know. Who knows why, you know, but, you know, this, you know, theories out there suggest that, you know, this could, uh, you know, this level of genetic detail, you know, puts fear in people because, you know, are we going to start protecting all species based on that level of genetic detail? And what would that mean for, uh, you know, the Endangered Species Act, which is such a lightning rod in American politics, because yeah, yeah. it literally affects, especially when you're talking about salmon, affects everything on the west coast related to water and and even out into the ocean so you know i think there's definitely a fear in the in the, in the federal bureaucracies of you know more regulatory measures because salmon are a migratory fish and they pass they don't have jurisdictions you know they pass through a lot of different you know business sectors and and um, political lines and there's definitely, I think, some fear out there that how how much how 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 much are we going to protect species using genetics versus like other other ways we look at them? Yeah, so either simpler, you know, more primitive, yeah. or not as uh, effective, even um, you know, standards or whatever. One of the things that you you were just talking about how uh, you know um, uh, how many you know. Uh, realms or whatever are affected by the fish i was shocked by the map that you put in the movie where um there were some salmon that were going halfway to japan uh on the map in terms of their annual migration um you know one of the things that uh i saw some documentary and i can't couldn't tell you who made it or what it was called a while ago but it was talking about um you know fisheries in general and their impact on ocean um biodiversity and uh is there a world where, you know, um, people can do things like they do in the Alaska fishery where they can fish for salmon for fun and not, um, I guess, how much reform is needed in, in the commercial fisheries in order to make salmon and, and other endangered species um, viable long term? Are we just going to, no matter what we do, are we just fishing ourselves into a, a hole? You know, I think 
I think the problem is what is is what's called a mixed stock fishery, where you're fishing over a bunch of different fish and not knowing what you catch. Mm -hmm. And I think that is when we need to change fishing seasons or return more to place-based fishing. And and place-based fishing is again what indigenous people have been doing for since time immemorial. And you know that's the only way you can truly manage a salmon stock is when it comes back to its river of origin and you can you know, let the first half of the run go before you start fishing and you can really kind of manage it. You know, the tribes in the Klamath Basin used to use weirs to let a certain number of fish go and reach their spawning grounds before they started fishing, you know, and, and it's impossible out in the open ocean to, to, to know the, you know, all that, all that detail and, and know what you're catching. Yeah, where but, it's coming from, right? Yeah, know where it's coming from. I mean, yeah. up in, you know, a lot of fish go up to you know, off the West Coast, head up to Alaska and get picked off in, in commercial fisheries and are sold in, as wild caught sustainable fish, even though that could be one of the last 30 fish in a, in a certain population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think California's done it better than I've seen it up in Washington, Oregon, Canada, and Alaska. I, I, I feel like that's one of the reasons why like the Butte Creek population and, and the Klamath populations haven't blinked out is because the ocean fisheries off the coast of California where those fish migrate, those fish don't go up to Alaska, they stay off the Humboldt Current. They don't open until after those fish should be returning to the rivers. And that was uh, some regulations that were put in, you know, maybe 20 years ago or something. So mm -hmm. I, I do feel like California's on, on a much more progressive um, outlook for the, the fishing regulations than places like Alaska and Canada and Washington state. Yeah. One of the things that you made a point of in the film is that uh, while federal uh, Endangered Species Act protections are, uh, are lagging, the state of California has taken some action. Um, can you talk about the significance of that? Yeah, absolutely. So last fall, the state of California um, listed the Klamath populations under their Endangered Species Act. Uh, it's not federal, it's a state state law. And that was a real turning point and precedent setting that the, the agencies really listened, listened to the people, listened to the science and um, said, these fish are important and we need to protect them. So uh, I'm really excited to see how that unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a million questions. Uh, we have about another um, 10 minutes, a little bit less, uh, but um, I'll just start throwing them out there. Uh, <laughs> we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so I'm not a uh, an ichthyologist. Is that the right word? I don't know. Um, but the, uh, the difference between fall and river Chinook, um, why are the uh, um, spring Chinook so much more you know, challenged by uh, the fishing and all of that stuff? Why are they more susceptible to the pressures than the fall run salmon? Yeah, so, you know, just the nature of the evolution of the species. So spring run return sexually um, immature. So they're, you know, they enter the rivers and then basically have to spend, you know, upwards of six months in freshwater habitats surviving before they will spawn. And they do that so they can reach habitats that fall Chinook can't, can't reach. So they are able to fully seed a habitat of, for the Chinook salmon species. That's why the two runs have separated over okay. time, um, you know, to create more abundant salmon. I mean, that's just kind of like, like how do we restore healthy, you know, salmon pop, wild salmon populations? Diversity. And, you know, run timing migration is, you know, front and center in that diversity. So essentially, they're more susceptible to freshwater conditions and water conditions. They're more susceptible to predation, to human poaching and harvest and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they have different migrations in the ocean as well, which makes them more susceptible. So all around, they're just... They're, I like to call them the species of desire because since they enter sexually immature, they have more fat than any other species. And that's what makes them taste so good and what makes everything in the world want to eat them is because yeah. they're literally like, it's eating like butter butter salmon, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. it's the most incredible tasting fish on earth. It's, and, um, you know, when you're the most, you know, <laughs> when you're the best tasting animal out there, you know, that makes, that puts a target on your back for everything in the ecosystem, including the Southern resident killer whales that 
yeah, fully involved eating those fish too. Someone pull, uh, pulled up the figure of 137 species rely on the uh, on the spring run salmon. <laughs> Absolutely, including the trees and and everything. And you know, since they go through more of the watershed than other salmon species, that means more species within the watershed are relying on them too. Because fall chinook don't migrate as far, you know. So there's you know, if you think of the map of a river basin, it's like fall chinook only enter the lower river. Yeah, all the fish in the or all the uh, other animals and, and biodiversity in the lower river is benefiting for that couple months. But where spring chinook go, they're benefiting over like six months. Yeah. You know, one of the other uh, interesting things that I learned here that um, I think a lot of people might not know is that, the, you know, the there is that genetic difference that you mentioned between spring and fall Chinook, the one that sort of times their their runs. But uh, it's not so simple that you could just take some fall run salmon and make them spring run salmon by breeding them at the right time. It's like the hybridization causes an adjustment in the timing, but it doesn't. I mean, so they're coming up in the summer, which is worse, the worst possible option because the, the waters are low and all that stuff. So it's, again, that uh, really, really complex uh, the mechanisms that are at play that you know humans often arrogantly think well we can just fix it real quick by you know mashing these populations together in a lab or or whatever else but it, it's it's not that simple and i thought that was a fascinating um insight that uh people need to have it's like there, there's no simple way to put these species back to a, a good number it's like you just have to re restore the the watersheds and let them do their own survival you know yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're seeing a fish kill in the Klamath right now is because the fish that are returning are those hybridization fish from a spring and a fall that's kind of like this summer migrator. You know, historically, the, the Klamath Basin Spring Chinook was the dominant run. Those were the fish that went up into Oregon and, you know, up into those 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 volcanic like springs coming off Mount Shasta. I mean, Mount um, well, Mount Shasta too, but like uh, Crater Lake area, mm -hmm. uh, what was formerly Mount Mazama when those fish really evolved when there was glaciers up there. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, when they put the dams in a hundred years ago and cut that off, you know, it changed the flows of the river and it changed the migration characteristics and it allowed spring and fall Chinook to kind of interbreed. So for over a hundred years, we've we've kind of artificially created this summer run on the Klamath that's like returning right now in the most worst possible time when the river is the hottest. Yeah. And now we're seeing, you know, this disease spread and that's just probably not how the fish evolved. There was probably more of a, I'm sure there was always a summer component in the Klamath Basin, mm -hmm. but there was definitely more stronger spring component to where those fish would already be up in cold water refuges like thriving right now rather than being in the lower river dying of disease yeah and the fall run you know if you look at the other fall run populations on the north coast like the smith river and the eel river like those fish don't even come in till october and november it's like you know they're programmed like after it's raining you know and yeah there's water and it's cool yeah there's water and it's going to survive so you know these these animals have keyed into this co-evolution on the landscape since for millions of years and and you know throwing you know anthropogenic barriers literally like dams and stuff we've we've literally changed their genetic code to make them less resilient and then you throw climate change on top of it and that's why we're in a crisis right now yeah yeah absolutely um uh i had a thought in my head and now i'm forgetting what it was <laughs> um the fish kill on the klamath right now how what's the uh um scope of that is that uh, i mean what did you see when you went up there yeah we're um so we first found dead fish about five days ago i think we counted about 20 you know beautiful big bright chinook that you know we sh should be celebrating this incredible run coming back to the klamath this year but now everybody's on edge we don't know what's going to happen and um all the fish so there's a few things happening. There's the 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 clam of this is really muddy and sediment load right now from the McKinney fire debris flows. Yeah, yeah. And I think that coupled with this heat wave um, and temperature spike really affected the dissolved oxygen in the Klamath River. So the fish are literally like, you know, vectors for these disease called calamaris and ick, and 
now they're like going, they're looking for any kind of like clean cold water. So in places like Blue Creek and Bluff Creek and wherever the Trinity and wherever there's like cold water clean inputs, they're just stacking in there by the thousands right now. And when they stack in there by the thousands, they spread the disease like wildfire to one another. That's not how these fish, where these fish should be right now. They should be in the river traveling to their each unique creeks or habitat niches. And instead they're just like anything to get some cold water, which in turn is, is spreading the disease, unfortunately. Yeah, tragic. Um, you know, people are gonna um, wanna watch the film. What do you know about distribution ultimately and when people might be able to see it on their uh, local PBS stations? Yeah, you bet. So we did our first premiere in Washington a couple of nights ago, and then it will be available October 29th on the PBS Passport app, um, okay, you know, great. streaming, just a yeah. streaming service, and on available on uh, NIDA for other stations across the country to pick up. Yep, and we'll, we will be doing so. Um, one of the things I also wanted to ask is if people are, uh, you know, um, work in an office and don't have the time to get out in the field and make documentaries about the uh, salmon fisheries and what they can do. How would you suggest people get involved to try and help as best they can? Yeah, since I guess it's the pro the, the, the problem and the plight of Springers is, is so widespread, I would say get involved, like figure out like where your local kind of population is or where your, you know, place that, um, local grassroots organization or people working on the issues and, you know, learn about it and there's people working on it right now. So I think there's gonna be a lot of um, momentum in the next year kind of around this whole Endangered Species Act decisions on the federal level mm -hmm. from Klamath, Oregon coast, Washington coast, there's petitions all, all up and down the West coast, you know, that will be reviewed this year. So keep an eye out because there'll be public comment and, and it's really public comment that drives policy. You know, if enough people say, we need you to, we, we demand that you protect these, the agencies have to listen to the people because they work for the people. So voice matters. Yeah. And my, my last question, I guess, is like, I mean, as I mentioned, you were all over the map for the making of this. Um, what did you, um, what do you think was the most valuable lesson you learned personally um, from the making of the film? You know, I, I'll probably go back to that whole like modern science catching up with traditional ecological knowledge. I didn't really know much about that going into this story and that was a huge revelation from me is yeah. um just how important it is to to listen to the indigenous voices that have lived on the land with co evolved with these fish in in looking forward to like returning to a you know ethos of of, of world renewal and restoration and, and regeneration um just you know that evolve uh, evolution and then applying these new genetic tools and into policy yeah well shane i appreciate your time thank you for uh doing this and keep in touch man i love your work i i was absolutely thrilled to see this movie so i appreciate you reaching out awesome really appreciate it james all right man talk to you soon that's it for tonight stay tuned stay informed